So as I've mentioned before, <clears throat> if you watched the blood pressure video before this one, that blood is always flowing through the heart because of pressure gradients. And it will always flow from high pressure to low pressure. So in this video, we're going to take a look at how does the heart generate that pressure that initially starts blood flow into the arterial system and, um, and how do we regulate that. So the first concept we need to know is cardiac output. And this is the amount of blood pumped out by each ventricle in one minute. So as your heart beats 60 times a minute, um, or however many times, whatever your heart rate is, then there's another factor that affects how much blood is moved, and that's stroke volume, which is how much blood comes out with each beat. So this is how many times we beat in a minute, and how much blood comes out with each beat. And that will equal our cardiac output. Now, um, because uh, we have um, about five liters of blood in our um, body and because we beat on average 75 times a minute during wakeful times, uh, also depending upon uh, the degree of our cardiovascular health, and we pump out about 70 milliliters per beat, then that's going to add up to, or that's going to come to uh, produce 5.25 liters per minute. So what that means is that every minute our entire blood supply is circulating through our body and coming back to um, its original starting place. So um, uh, all of our blood goes out to, goes through one point as, as it travels through the blood, or it travels through the body in a minute. Now, um, that's typically how much, under normal resting conditions, um, how much blood our tissues need, but if we have a greater oxygen demand or nutrient demand somewhere in our body, then um, we can increase this cardiac output either by increasing stroke, or I mean uh, uh, heart rate or stroke volume or both of them. If we take a look at this graphic, this shows everything that affects cardiac output. So if we look at what controls heart rate, what causes an increase in heart rate, it'll be an increase in sympathetic activity and a decrease of parasympathetic activity. What will cause that increase in sympathetic activity? Well, typically exercise, fright, or anxiety will cause flight or fight response and, and decrease the amount of uh, parasympathetic stimulus on the heart. Uh, also, sympathetic activity not only increases the heart rate, but it's going to go over here and increase stroke volume as well by increasing the contractility of the heart, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So stroke volume is determined by two things. Um, one is called EDV, which is end diastolic volume, and that's the amount of blood that enters the heart. We can call that preload. When we fill up the blood, I mean fill up the heart before we eject it, so we're loading it ahead of time. And um, ESV stands for end systolic volume, and so if we want to increase the stroke volume, it's the difference between EDV and ESV. So to increase stroke volume, we would increase EDV and decrease ESV. So how do we um, increase the amount of blood that returns to the heart? Well, we increase our venous return, and we'll come back to that in just a second. Um, and if we want to decrease ESV, then how do we do that? Well, we want less blood remaining in the heart per contraction, so we're going to make the heart contract harder. So how do we get an increased venous return? Well, exercise increases our sympathetic activity, um, and our skeletal muscles are contracting s more strongly and more rapidly, and we're breathing faster. And so our skeletal muscle pump and our respiratory pump will be increased to increase our venous return, which we talked about already in the, in the uh, blood pressure regulation. And then um, this will cause a decrease in heart rate. Now you would think, but isn't sympathetic stimulation causing an increase in heart rate, but it has to do with um, how much preload is coming in. So if I'm increasing the amount of blood that's coming into the heart, then it will slow down the heart rate so that I can um, have more time to fill. And so both of those factors will increase venous return. And then contractility is going to be increased by epinephrine or more calcium or thyroxine, depending on the situation. All right, so it, when we need more blood, 
then we we tap into our cardiac reserve and our cardiac reserve is how much more blood we can pump with exertion so typically non-athletic individuals as we're working out running whatever we um, will increase our cardiac output four to five times so we can circulate in a minute between 20 and 25 liters of blood through any one point in our body but athletes ones who are specifically trained and have a strong cardiovascular system can move up to 35 milliliters or even more per minute. All right, so I briefly mentioned what stroke volume was. Stroke volume is the amount of blood that leaves the heart per beat, and how do we determine that? Well, we take how much comes into the heart and how much remains in the heart, and then that gives us our stroke volume. So EDV and diastolic volume, how much blood is in the ventricle after it's filled, about 120 milliliters. ESV is how much is left after it contracts, and it's about 50 milliliters. So keep in mind the heart does not empty with each beat. That, that a little less than half of the blood that entered remains in the heart. So SV ends up about 70 and how do we change that? So we can change that through preload. So preload is a measure of the stretch of the heart muscle um, and this is the Frank Starling law of the heart that the greater the stretch of cardiac muscle the greater the force of contraction. And like it says, this optimizes the number of active cross bridges possible between actin and myosin. And we can see that in skeletal muscle. If we increase the length of a sarcomere so that we get the greatest number of actin and myosin filaments overlapping with the greatest distance, the largest H zone that we have in a sarcomere, we're going to produce the greatest amount of force. If we stretch the heart too much or if we stretch a muscle too much, then the actin and myosin don't overlap anymore. And if we don't stretch out the muscle, then the, uh, the thin filaments will be too close together in the H zone and then we won't have uh, much distance for the sarcomere to shorten. So again, to maximize the force that a muscle can produce, we want to maximize the length of the sarcomere. Now in, in our skeletal muscles, all we have to do is stretch out our limbs and that would stretch out a muscle, but you can't grab onto the ventricle of the heart and stretch that out. So how do we get that to happen when we do that by filling with blood? So as we increase EDV, it will stretch out the ventricle like putting air into a balloon or water into a balloon. And EDV will increase as we increase our venous return. And then we'll get a conversely a, a slower heart rate which gives us more time to fill the ventricles and increase our preload even more and exercise will speed up our, our venous return so all of these things are going to work together to increase our stroke volume and like it says stroke volume may actually double due to um, preload and the slowing of the heart so that you have more time to fill um, and then there's uh, contractility how do we make the heart beat stronger um, even with preload and so we want to, or so, well, after we load it, now we want to pump the blood out. So how do we make it stronger once we want to pump the blood out? Well, um, calcium is also always a determinant of how strong muscle contraction can be um, by allowing more actin and myosin to bind with one another. So if we make more calcium available in the sarcomere, more tropomyosin it will be pulled out of the way of the myosin binding sites on actin and more contraction can take place. So we have calcium coming in. I'll show you a little picture of that in just a second. So the calcium channels that we, um, that we had with the cardiac muscle action potential, if we can make, more, make them more permeable and increase more um, uh, calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, then that will cause a more complete ejection of blood and a lower ESV. So contractility will increase with an increase in sympathetic stimulation because epinephrine will make the heart more permeable to, to calcium. And um, if I have too little calcium or if I have too much potassium or too many hydrogen ions, then that is going to decrease the contractility that I have in the heart. So here's an example of how does sympathetic stimulation increase contractility. So there's norepinephrine or epinephrine, it doesn't matter, it's beta adrenergic receptor. We'll bind to that, that will activate GDP, which will come over here and activate cyclic, um, I mean not activate GDP, this will activate G protein. And then G protein will come over here and um, activate adenylate cyclase, which will increase cellular levels of cyclic AMP, which will trigger a protein kinase that will activate the um, calcium uh, exit 
from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or if I have calcium coming in from the outside, I don't have to have um, uh, a neurotransmitter or a hormone doing this. Calcium coming in from the outside um, will also activate the protein kinase and then um, uh, cause um, more calcium to be released on the next beat. So this calcium came out, calcium came back in. Okay, um, now unfortunately, afterload can inhibit contractility, and so this would be if there was too much pressure on the pulmonary and aortic valves, and, uh, and, and so the ventricles had to work harder to push the blood away from the ventricles and caught, I mean, away from the valves and open them up. Um, fortunately, in healthy individuals, this is not a problem, but uh, we do see problems with afterload on individuals with hypertension. Um, and so you can see if I have afterload, more blood return remains in the heart and I have a decreased ESV and my, my uh, ejection fraction will be less. Um, so this just shows, here's what happens with preload, more blood comes in, you can see the volume of the heart increasing and then afterload is this pushback on the valves and so the heart has to push that much harder to open up those valves and allow the blood to exit the heart. All right, so how do we control um, cardiac output? Well, there's, there are two different ways. We have, um, first of all, extrinsic innervation of the heart. So this is where um, the vagus nerve or sympathetic uh, efferents from the thoracolumbar region of the spinal cord will um, act on the SA node and the AB node, or in the case of sympathetic stimulation, will also act on the contractility of the heart muscle. So keep in mind, sympathetic division increases heart rate and force with the presence of norepinephrine. Uh, parasympathetic, on the other hand, decreases um, heart rate because the vagus nerve and its uh, neurotransmitter acetylcholine will actually hyperpolarize the heart and slow it down. And what's interesting here is that the, the SA node really wants to fire much more quickly, likes to gallop along. And uh, so it wants to beat more up around 100 beats per minute, but the vagus nerve is always stimulating the heart and in its stimulation slows it down, and therefore um, uh, our, our resting heart rate is actually about 25 beats per minute uh, slower than what our heart wants to contract. Um, so if we cut the vagus nerve, then the heart rate would go right back up again. Uh, here is a diagram that shows uh, where the nervous uh, stimulus comes from. So here in the medulla, we have two heart centers. We have the cardioaccelerator center that works with the sympathetic stimulation, and then we have the cardioinhibitory center that works with the parasympathetic stimulation. So um, as the cardioaccelerator center sends its signals out to the heart in these sympathetic efferents, then it will go to the SA node, to the AV node, and to the cardiac muscle itself to make it more permeable to calcium, more permeable to sodium here, but more permeable to calcium here on the cardiac muscle and causing that contractility to increase. So it beats more strongly as it's beating faster. Uh, the vagus nerve on the other hand is gonna come here from the cardio inhibitory center and then it's gonna run out here and it's going to hyperpolarize the SA node and the AV node. But notice it does not act on the cardiac muscle itself of the ventricle. All right, so there, there's that information that I just went over. Um, and here I, is just what I said about norepinephrine binding the beta adrenergic receptors. Threshold of cardiac muscle is reached more quickly. Um, relaxation is accelerated. Pacemaker fires more rapidly and the heart beats faster. And norepinephrine also allows more calcium in. And we really want to couple these two things because if you're beating fast, you can't fill very well and you can't eject very well. And so we want to um, beat fast, but we want to beat strongly. We don't want a rapid, weak heartbeat. We want a rapid, strong heartbeat. Um, and there you go. Um, okay, so acetylcholine then is the neurotransmitter of the vagus nerve, hyperpolarizes the SA node and AV nodes. Um, now, this is an important thing too to remember that under resting conditions, both sympathetic and parasympathetic send signals, but we're getting more signals being sent by parasympathetic stimulation to keep us um, our heart rate's low and you know the minute you slam on your brakes to make sure you don't run over that cat in the road, um, your heart immediately starts beating faster. That's because immediately you start sending more sympathetic 
signals stimuli to the uh, SA node and the AV node and um, and then uh, immediately your heart beats faster. Okay, so they're both stimulating the heart at the same time, just in most cases uh, parasympathetic uh, signals are stronger or come at a more rapid pace. Um, Okay, now here's a really interesting thing that I don't know that I noticed in your study guide um, is vagal tone. So like I said, the vagus nerve wants to um, slow down the heart and, uh, and keep it from beating too quickly. Well, sometimes um, we cause more vagal tone, more vagal stimulation to go on um, if we're activating certain aspects of our... Um, uh, feed or breed response. So our digestive tract, for example. So let's say that you are constipated and you really are having a difficult time going to the bathroom and you bear down or you're having a baby, either one. And you're bearing down and you're trying, you're really pushing hard, you're really activating sympathetic, I mean parasympathetic stimulation in, in the lower areas of your colon. And um, and because the vagus nerve is sending those signals, then that will stimulate to try to get that smooth muscle to, to move those that feces along. But at the same time, because it's vagal stimulation, it's going to slow down your heart. And so when we're bearing down, our, our heart rate goes down and down and down and, and maybe too much. And so if our vagal tone is too great because we're bearing down and... and um, uh, our heart says, hey, you know what? That is way too slow that our heart will speed back up again. And uh, because it'll listen to the sympathetic stimulation and the heart will increase its rate and ig basically ignore um, that vagal tone. So we call that vagal escape. So fortunately, when we are having a difficulty, you know, being constipated, that our hearts don't stop. Unfortunately, a lot of times with the elderly, their hearts can't handle that that vagal tone, that vagal inhibition that's going on in their heart, and so they'll be um, in the bathroom and trying to have a bowel movement, and their hearts will stop, and they won't start again, and they'll pass out, and oftentimes they'll die, and uh, sadly, uh, it happens so commonly that both the EMT and paramedic world and the um, um, funeral service world uh, call this a commode code. So they know that if if it comes across a call um, that there's a commode code, then they know that the patient or the individual that's passed away is in their bathroom and, and has died because of too much vagal stimulation. Um, my son is going to be a funeral director. My His dad, um, was also a funeral director, and they both have experienced that um, uh, in their careers. <laughs> and um, it's sad, but it's an interesting thing that happens, and that's why it happens. All right, now on to stuff that you still really care about. So um, we also have some reflexes that go on. If we, uh, if the baroreceptors, uh, are, are stimulated by systemic blood pressure in, in the aorta and the carotid sinus, then um, we'll kick in the Bainbridge reflex, um, which will also happen as a result of um, venous return and blood congestion in the atria. And then the um, atrial walls will stretch. This will go and stimulate the SA node and stretch receptors will trigger a reflex that increases the sympathetic stimulation of the heart. So we have reflexes detecting the amount of congestion and, and increase in uh, uh, pressure around the heart and leaving the heart so that we can speed it up and, and get that blood out of there. Now, both of those are... Um, our uh, neural means by which we affect um, cardiac output and what the heart is doing, but we also have chemical regulation. So um, uh, hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, are going to increase heart rate and contractility. Thyroxin, on the other hand, is going to increase um, 
heart rate, but at a more slower rate. Um, if you have thyroxine in large quantities, that means your metabolic rate will increase. And if your metabolic rate has increased, then your cells need more glucose and oxygen. And so it um, causes the heart to have the ability to, to um, uh, supply that extra uh, uh, glucose and oxygen to the highly respiring tissues. Um, okay. I'm not going to go through the ions. I don't know how much um, will be on the exam about ions, but there's that if you want to take a look at that. And other factors that are going to affect heart rate um, are age, gender, exercise, and body temperature. Um, this body temperature thing, um, know that as, you're, as you are warmer, as your body temperature goes up, your heart rate goes up, and as your body temperature goes down, your your heart rate goes down and and this is really interesting when you think about well why when I'm hot why would I need a greater cardiac output well I need to move more blood around so that I can do evaporative cooling so I can get it back to my core and, and cool me down and then why would I want my heart rate to slow down when I'm cold well one I don't want to move as much blood out to my extremities so that I cool off my blood too rapidly but there's a more important reason why our heart rate slows down as an effect of cold temperature and that's something called the mammalian diving reflex. Um, if you've ever noticed when you jump into a cold swimming pool and you realize how cold it is, you hold your breath and, and you feel like your heart just stopped. Well, what that, that whole mammalian diving reflex is part of cardiac output and respiration so that, that um, animals, that mammals that are living in the oceans and cold temperatures as they're feeding in the water that they can spend more time underwater um, and and not have to come up for air as much and it's something that in my in my classes I talk about a whole lot I think it's a very significant concept um, but uh, if you're interested in knowing more I don't know if they'll get into it in respiration in this class or not but uh, I I love the mammalian diving reflex it's really cool Okay, make sure, I guess I didn't see this in the study guide somewhere, but make sure you know what tachycardia is, abnormally fast heart rate, um, lots of things. So uh, heart rate greater than 100 at rest, okay, so um, you're just sitting in your chair and your heart rate's above 100, then you know something's wrong. Bradycardia, on the other hand, is a heart rate slower than 60, so 60 and 100, those are, you know, the two extremes of our uh, essay node. So why do we have bradycardia? Well, most of the time it's fine, decreased body temperature, sometimes medication, some parasympathetic stimulation, or endurance um, uh, type athletic training. So the more that you work out um, and do cardiovascular kinds of training activities, um, aerobic activities, that will increase the strength of your heart and cause your heart to beat fewer times in a minute because you are delivering more blood per beat. Um, I'm just going to show you this. I don't know that we talked about this, but congestive heart failure is where the cardiac output of the heart is so low, but blood circulation is inadequate to meet tissue needs. Um, usually with congestive heart failure, it gets worse and worse and worse uh, because of problems with the myocardium, because of atherosclerosis, high blood pressure, multiple heart attacks, um, smoking, COPD, and pneumonia can all um, significantly contribute to the lack of your heart's ability to pump blood. Um, here, oh, so when I talked about with the blood vessels, when we talked about atherosclerosis, um, uh, here's why we have so much coronary uh, atherosclerosis because um, the blood entering them is the most oxygen and nutrient rich. It's not really full of fat, but you know what? Nobody else has taken out any of that stuff yet. So, um, uh, so there's that, and then the coronary arteries are very small and then they branch rapidly so the bifurcations are places where the plaques can build. Um, so uh, persistent high blood pressure is um, when our um, uh, baroreceptors reset to a higher level and, and then that creates afterload and our ESV is going to rise, the myocardium can hypertrophy and, uh, and so that stress on the heart, we don't want uh, cardiac muscle to hypertrophy like we want 
skeletal muscle to do that. And, um, and so the, the myocardium becomes progressively weaker, just like when you blow up a balloon too many times and it, and it stretches out. Um, and the wall of the balloon is not as strong anymore. That's uh, also kind of what's happening with cardiomyopathy. Um, and there are different reasons why cardiomyopathy happens, but the, the outcome is that cardiac output is poor because the ventric, uh, ventricular contractility is impaired and the condition continues to worsen. Uh, I think I mentioned this before, left side failure is if the left side can't pump the blood out to the rest of the body, then it's going to back up in the lungs and we'll get, we're going to get pulmonary congestion and pulmonary edema. If we have a right side failure, then the blood's going to back up in the, uh, in the systemic circulation, most noticeably out in the, in the uh, extremities, hands and feet will become swollen um, and uh, the blood will remain out in the body. and uh, and it will stagnate. Um, heart murmur is just when blood's flowing back and we have valves that don't work properly within the heart and they allow blood to move back the other way and that's it.